shoot, so to speak. Hello, how's everyone doing today? I'm here with special guest uh, Walter Block. Walter Block uh, is an Austrian economist. He teaches at Loyola University. He is the author of the uh, trilogy of books coming out soon, uh, defending the uh, defending the undefendable, uh, the case for discrimination, legalizing blackmail, and a host of other provocative titles. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on your show again. Anytime. Always an uh, interesting guest. Um, anyway, I guess my first question, uh, and I asked you this, it was great to finally meet you uh, in person. Um, my first question has to do with uh, fractional reserve banking. Because based, you know, I'm not really sure my view on the matter, but when I uh, was reading some stuff by Larry White, what he said seemed to make sense that, that under free banking, uh, the problem with fractional reserve banking really is not the fractional reserve banking, but the fact that they get saved if they inflate, that they get saved by the government. But if you have free banking, uh, certain banks would be able to inflate, and there'd be a contract. We are going to lend out your money, and people know that this is a fractional reserve bankings, and they have to weigh it. Are, are they, are they going to go to a bank that has fractional reserve banking and collect interest, or are they not going to go to one? And under free banking, they wouldn't be bailed out if the bank's reserve uh, maximize the reserves. So the banks would be punished at the end of the day. So what, what's the problem with that? Well, there are two problems, um, two, two main problems. One, uh, I think that the fractional reserve banking would create the Austrian business cycle. Uh, because we'd have extra money, which would uh, lower interest rates, which would uh, lead uh, entrepreneurs to invest in earlier orders of goods, uh, heavy capital equipment. And if that's so, uh, we have a, a little problem uh, because we have a market failure. Uh, if, if you think of um, fraction reserve banking or free banking as part of the market, as Larry White does, and you also agree that it uh, creates the Austrian business cycle, well, then we have a case of market failure. And uh, Austrians sort of run from market failure the way the, um, I don't know, the vampire runs from the cross. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's anathema to our whole system. Our whole system is predicated on no market failures, which doesn't mean that individual entrepreneurs can't make mistakes. We're only human. We all we always make mistakes. But market failure means there's some sort of systematic uh, difficulty with the free enterprise system. I think that's a minor problem. The major problem is not so much Austrian, but more libertarian. And uh, the way Larry and George Seldrin and other um, free banker types see this, uh, they see the basis of um, libertarianism if I can put words in their mouth, and I think it's accurate, as a contract. If you and I agree to something, well, that's it. You know, uh, anything between consenting adults and uh, don't bother me with any details. Whereas I and um, Hans Hoppe and Guido Holtzman and Murray Rothbard and other opponents of um, fraction reserve banking or free banking <coughs> see something very different. We don't see contract as the be all and end all. Uh, we see private property rights as the be all and end all, namely the the foundation of, of libertarianism. Yes, contracts based on private property rights are fine, but uh, hanging in the air with no support from private property rights, uh, no. So first, let me give you some examples of um, contracts that are invalid. Uh, suppose I hire you to go kill Joe, the innocent Joe. I mean, that's an invalid contract. Uh, second, suppose I make a contract to sell you a pink elephant or a unicorn. And there are no pink elephants, and I'm not talking about an elephant that you paint pink, but, you know, a pink elephant and a unicorn. Uh, and I'm not talking about a horse where you stick on a, a horn. Um, there are no unicorns. There are no um, pink elephants. So a contract to buy or sell one of them is invalid. Another uh, contract, suppose I, uh, I'll sell you a square circle for $10. Well, that's an invalid contract, too, because uh, not only aren't there any square circles, but there can't be any square circles because it's a contradiction in terms. So uh, these are cases of uh, 
contracts that, that are invalid because they, they're not in accord with reality. Uh, they're not in accord with, you know, th these things don't or can't exist. I mean, a, a unicorn could exist or a pink elephant could, but a square circle can't. So either they don't exist or they can't exist. And to have a contract predicated on them is just, um, I don't know, uh, wrong-headed, silly, problematic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, right now in New Orleans, where I am, there are, I don't know, uh, a million cars, say. I don't know if there are, but let's stipulate a million cars, hypothetically. How many titles to cars to those cars are there? A million. You know, uh, if I start creating a few extra titles to cars with no cars, then we have a problem. We have more titles to property than property, and, and th this is a, a, a problem. Uh, and, and it's exactly the problem with fractional reserve banking. Uh, you can't have more property titles than there is property. There was this wonderful movie, um, The Producers. Did you see that movie uh, where, yeah. where uh, Zero Mostel is making a play, Springtime for Hitler, a great play. Everyone should see that play and the movie. And he starts selling shares of this play to little old ladies. And, you know, the, this little old lady gets 50% of the uh, the play and uh, some of the little old lady gets 75% of it and somebody else gets 90%. You can't sell more uh, uh, parts of the play than, than, than 100%. I mean, there's only 100% of one play. And you see, you and I can own uh, a car halfy halfy. You own 50% of the car, I own 50%. You use it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I use it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But we can't each own 100% of the car. We can only own 50% of the car. And yet, that's exactly what uh, these uh, rascals are proposing in the name of Austrian uh, libertarianism, predicated on, on mere. Uh, agreement in um, uh, contracts. You know, some fools agree that we can have this contract, and and uh, Larry and George. Uh, uh, I'm not saying they're fools. I'm I'm saying that, that they support this. I don't think they're fools at all. I think they're brilliant in in every other regard except for this one issue. Okay, so here's an example. I um, uh, I'm a I have a hundred bucks, and I go to your bank and I deposit a hundred bucks. And uh, you give me a demand deposit for 100 bucks, And now I can spend that whenever I want. I can call upon you because it's a demand deposit. I can call upon you whenever I want to give me that 90 uh, to give me that $100. But you, you dirty rat, are a fraction reserve banker. So what you do is you go and lend out 90 of it to someone else. And you give him a demand deposit. And now you have 10 bucks, and you have 190 outstanding, and you're, um, you're bankrupt in the sense that your instantaneous assets, 10, <laughs> are less than your instantaneous debts, 190, and you should be you know, put out of business because you're bankrupt. Now, if you had a time deposit, that's a little different. You know, uh, like if I said, I'll give you $100, and, and I'm not getting a demand deposit, I'm just getting a time deposit, uh, say, a year. So... Uh, I can come back to you any time and say, hey, give me back my 100 and you can say, well, sorry, I, I'll only give you 5 or 10 but I'm not giving you the 100 because I, I'm not obligated to do so until a year from now. And then you can lend it out to somebody else uh, lend in it, and, and um, then there's no problem. You, then if you have a fraction reserve time deposit, that's okay uh, because uh, you're not obligated to pay it immediately. Now, there is such a thing as a fraction reserve parking lot, and there is such a thing as airline overbooking, and that, that would be the objection that uh, White and Sultan would uh, perhaps uh, offer. And uh, in the article that I wrote with uh, Hans Hoppe and uh, Guido Holtzman, we dealt with that issue, and we said, look, if you have a parking lot with 100 spaces, you can sell 300 tickets, but you can't say that there's a guarantee for for a space. You can just say it's a hunting license or a fishing license. Namely, you can come into the lot and look for a spot. Like what they do on airplanes, like they sell more tickets on airplanes, right? Yeah, they, they'll sell, say, 150 uh, 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 seats or 150 tickets for 125-seat uh, uh, airplane because they, they want to get a full plane. And a lot of times people punk out at the end that it just don't show up. And, um, you know, so they sell 150 tickets and they fill it up with 125 people, fine. Uh, 
But suppose 130 people show up for the 125 seats. Well, they are obligated to, to, to give a ride to 130 people, uh, to 150, but only 130 show up. So what they do is they say, now, now, you know, we, we need five people to, you know, to give us their tickets and we'll put you on a plane tomorrow morning and we'll buy you a meal and we'll put you up in a motel and that's fine. But if five people don't hop up, then they have to say, well, you know, that uh, $500 we were going to give you, it's 600 or 700 Namely, they have to keep going until they uh, meet their obligations. So I think that um, those would be legitimate. Uh, but not um, fraction reserve banking where you have a very different kind of a system because th then you have more titles to property than there is property. You have in this case 190 titles to dollars and only ten dollars and you know that, that's just um, you know the producers all over again. Right. So let's I guess just just to make clear let's let's take the um, the airplane example. Let's say there was a, it said on the back of the ticket you know uh, you take your chances, or it's known that you take your chances, and and more people show up, but they say we're not going to put you in a hotel, we're not going to give you another flight. That should not be allowed. Right. No, no, no that would be fine. A, a lottery ticket. In other words, uh, look. Suppose that, that uh, that's another good defense of the white soldier position, and I appreciate that. Uh, suppose that that instead of a demand deposit, it was a lottery ticket, namely. Uh, <laughs> You put on the thing, you know, I've, I've got $10, I've got 190 outstanding. And uh, if you come in, uh, you know, maybe you'll get your money, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, that would not be a demand deposit, and that would be legitimate. Mm -hmm. But a demand deposit is, is something, you know, it's as good as money. Uh, you know, you, you, I demand that 100 because you gave me a demand deposit, you're the banker. Now, if all you gave me was a lottery ticket, or if all you said is, look, I'll give you the money if I've got it, well, that's not a demand deposit. Or I'll give you the money within a year. That's not a demand deposit. That's a time deposit. Uh, Larry White and George Selgin are talking about a demand deposit. And that means that there's more property titles chasing cars uh, than there are cars, right? Mm -hmm. And that is uh, a violation of property, private property rights, which undergirds, under uh, supports is the foundation of contract and the foundation of everything and these guys uh, just uh, take the cut too too high namely the, they start with with contract they say well it's a valid contract everyone agrees no it's got to be in accord with property rights and I get back to the unicorn and the um, uh, the square circle and all that okay so what I usually uh, criticize fraction or reserve banking to people uh, the number one response that I get is, well, if you didn't have fractional reserve banking, banks would not make loans. Well, that's that's that, that's preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, there would be two kinds of banking. There would be um, uh, demand deposit banking where there's no loans. It, it's sort of like a warehouse. You know, I give you a hundred bucks. The, you have a bigger safe. You're bigger and tougher than me, so criminals aren't going to steal it from you. They might steal it from me, so I want to put the hundred with you for safekeeping, and that's it. And there's no loans. Fine. But then there's time deposits. I put in a hundred dollars in your bank, and I, I say uh, I won't need this money for a year. And now you go out and lend it for a year, and now you're sort of like a tailor. What a tailor does is he takes either large cloth and breaks it into small coats or whatever, or he takes small little uh, bits of thread and, and sews into a coat. So, you know, I'm giving you a hundred bucks and uh, a thousand other people are giving you a hundred bucks and you could lend money to Bill Gates because now you've got a lot of money. Or Bill Gates puts in a million in, into your bank, time deposit, and now you lend out a hundred bucks each to little guys like me to, you know, go start some sort of business. So uh, banks could still be the intermediaries, the tailors of money, uh, lending and borrowing and intermediating and uh, putting people together, you know, putting Bill Gates together with a thousand people that want to borrow money or a thousand people that want to lend money to Bill Gates either way. Uh, so I, I think it's preposterous to say that a bank couldn't function as an intermediary just because it didn't have fractional reserve banking. No, I, I agree. Um, okay, great. 
I guess my next question, because it's it's big in the news and a lot of people are talking about it, is you know what's happening in Israel and and Gaza. Uh, what what are what what is your view? My view is sort of a, a pox on both their houses. You know, on neither side, I'm I'm particularly a fan of. Uh, but what what's your view in this whole issue? My view is. I won't say confused, <laughs> but I won't deny it either. Um, my view is perplexed, maybe. Uh, the way I look at everything, I have these eyeglasses, and it's called libertarianism. And again, libertarianism is based on private property rights. And the question is, is Israel the uh, rightful owner of the property rights that it claims? in which case Israel is right and Palestine, the Palestinians are wrong? Or are uh, the Israelis, the Jews, guilty of stealing land from the Palestinians, in which case the, the Palestinians are righteous in uh, maybe not bombing civilians, but you know, uh, being miffed, <laughs> being very perturbed that their land was stolen from them. And Murray Rothbard, who is my mentor, my guru, my uh, morning star, my evening star, my, my everything, is very, very clear on this. Israel stole lots of land, and they should give it back, and then uh, that's it, and, and the Palestinians are right. My own view is very, very much more perplexed than that. I, I don't think Murray is exactly right. So let's, let's discuss some of the specifics. One of the specifics is the 1948 war. And what happened was um, uh, Israel was declared a country. And by the way, you and I and Murray are obviously uh, anarcho capitalists. We're all anarchists. But we have to drop our anarchism, I think, for this analysis. We have to wear our minarchist uh, clothing. We have to, because. You know, if we just say all states are no good, well, then, you know, <laughs> then we get to your case, a pox on both of your houses. Uh, but I, I think that if you just do that, you're sort of punking out. You're not really um, getting into the nitty-gritty. You're not really addressing a real-world issue. Uh, you're, you're sort of, uh, you know, just uh, ignoring it. So let's suppose that states are legitimate. I mean, I, <laughs> I hate to say this, but <laughs> may I be struck down? <laughs> uh, you know, we're now talking about uh, peoples or states or, or whatever, and, and, and if we just say that, you know, no state is legitimate, then we're sort of out of the conversation. I don't want to be in the conversation. So uh, Israel was declared a state, and we'll now assume that a state is legitimate if all the people in it agree to the state. Of course, it wouldn't be a state then, but that's a whole other issue. And let's suppose that all the Jews agree to Israel, even though I know that there were some uh, rabbis uh, who uh, opposed Israel because they don't want Israel to be a state until the... Uh, who's that guy um, comes? The Messiah, the Neturi Karta. Oh, the Messiah, until the Messiah the comes. Karta is that group. Right, but let's yeah. forget about them for the moment. We have to yeah. simplify. Because I want to focus on, on property rights, as a good libertarian should. And, okay, so here's the, the Israel is declared a state, a legitimate state, and uh, it's got certain property, say, just the property owned by Jews legitimately, which isn't much, but, it, you know, it's something. Now, the Arabs don't much like this, so the Arabs are going to, you know, attack. And what the Arabs do is they send out a message to all the Palestinians there, they say, hey, Palestinians. Uh, I'm putting words in their mouth. They didn't say hey, but uh, roughly they said something like, get out, because if you're there, then you sort of slow us up and we can't really kick Jew butt uh, because we're afraid of hitting you. Whereas if you get out, then you know we'll pulverize th these people and uh, these vermin, and uh, you know, after we uh, drive them to the sea or kill them all or whatever, then, you know, you can come back and things will be cool and groovy. Okay, so the Palestinians leave. Not all of them. Many of them leave. And uh, what happens is that the war turns the other way around, namely the Israelis win. Uh, it wasn't even much of a... I don't even know if they had the IDF. It was mainly the Stern gang and some other gangs there that fought them. 
uh, and they, they were very corrupt. You know, the, the Egyptian generals were selling, you know, guns to the Israelis and all. So anyway, they lose. Okay, so now uh, the Palestinians want to come back. And the Jews say, as Cartman would say, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys, you can't come back. And the Palestinians say, what do you mean? We didn't do anything wrong. We went on a vacation, in effect. We left our territory. You know, you go on a vacation, you come back to your house, you expect to live in your house. Or we were just doing it for safety reasons, which is legitimate also. And the Jews, or the, the argument in favor of the Jews is, no, 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 it, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't safety and it wasn't a vacation. Rather, it was aiding and abetting the enemy. You were a traitor to the, to the Jewish state. And the Jewish state includes Palestinians. And by the way, there were some Palestinians who didn't leave. And those Palestinians are now Israeli citizens. So Murray takes the view that Israel is totally wrong. The uh, Israeli supporters take the view that Israeli was... Israel was totally right. I am perplexed. I'm not sure. I, I don't know how to weigh this. Uh, it seems to me almost imponderable. It seems almost like a, a continuum problem or a gray area. You know, if you go to bed with a five-year-old girl, you're a statutory rapist, even if she agrees, because we don't think she's capable of agreeing. If you go to bed with a 25-year-old girl or woman uh, and she agrees, well, then you're not a rapist, you know, uh, because we think 25-year-olds can give consent. Well, what about a 15-year-old or a 14 or a 16 or a 12 or a 17-year-old girl? I don't know. Uh, there's no red line in the sand where you say, well, it's 16 years and four months and, and that's it. And uh, a similar thing sort of seems to me to be operating with, well, how do you interpret the Palestinians who left? Uh, were, were they traitors to the country? And if they're traitors, uh, then given, you know, we're now statists here, you and I are statists, well, you know, they should be punished, and, uh, you know, certainly they should lose their land. Okay, so another uh, perplexity is Jews also lost land in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, or wherever, and um, they were never given their land back and they feared to return because if they returned they'd all be killed and maybe what we should do is uh, be collectivists here and say okay look uh, Palestinians uh, you can't come back to your land um, but you can go and take over the Jewish land that was stolen from the Jews in Egypt and Syria and everywhere else like that and, and that way there'll be no land theft and that sort of seems reasonable if you're a collectivist enough, which is a problem for libertarians. Uh, slight, pro well, not a slight problem, a very serious problem. On the other hand, you get the Sykes Picot uh, thing. Uh, Sykes was an Englishman and Picot was a Frenchman. And the way they dis divided up um, Iraq and Iran and all these places when the Ottoman Empire and the Turkish people left is, I don't know how they did it. They just sort of drew lines on, on a map and said, okay, this is Iraq, this is Iran, this is Syria, this is Jordan. And what they had uh, was sort of a recipe for fighting forever because you had Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds all in the same country, whereas if you had any rationality, you would um, uh, have, you know, Kurdistan or Sunni Stan or uh, uh, Shiite Stan, you know, namely the countries would be the peoples. And I think Murray, uh, I'm not sure of this, but I think Murray disagreed with the Pico, uh, sykes Pico divvying up of the Middle East as, you know, just a disaster. Well, if he's going to be true to that, then he should support this idea of, well, okay, the, the uh, Palestinians can't come back to Israel, but they can take over the Jew Jewish land in, um, you know, um, uh, Egypt and Syria. Okay, so that's one big mess. The second big mess uh, that I'm not able to figure out right now, but you know, I think to just articulate indecision and confusion in a in a brilliant way <laughs> is is a positive contribution because now maybe people listening to this will say, "Aha, block! You know, you missed this," and and then you know, together we can 
uh, get more clarification. Okay, so the second issue is uh, some of the Jewish land was legitimate. Jews have been there since the year one, and they've homesteaded and everything was fine. But then a lot of the Jewish land in the early 20th century was purchased, purchased, not homesteaded, but purchased, and they were. It was purchased on um, under Ottoman or Turkish rule, under the the law. Namely, if you were a Jew in nineteen, uh, I don't know, twenty two, and you wanted to buy some land, you would go to the owner, and you'd say, "Hey, uh, owner, uh, I'll give you you know ten thousand dollars. Give me this house, or give me this acreage, or whatever it is." And the guy would say yes, and that was fine. But the problem was that from a libertarian point of view, that this land was not really, uh, the Turkish or the Ottoman, or I'm not sure, I'm, I'm a little weak on, on history here, the claim is that this land was not really properly owned by whoever the Turks or the Ottomans said, it was rather owned by the Palestinians from whom the Turks or the Ottomans stole it, and therefore when the Jews bought land, they bought stolen land. And, and therefore it should be given back to them. And, and uh, so we get another chunk. I don't know what the percentage is, but another chunk of uh, land in the Israeli hands is claimed to be owned by, uh, really owned by, by Palestinians in righteousness, even though the land titles were bought legitimately, in quotes, uh, namely under Turkish or Ottoman or, the, uh, I don't know, uh, rule from uh, Austria, Hungary, or whoever was in charge there. And this is a very powerful argument also for the libertarians, namely that they bought the land uh, under false pretenses. But, you know, we're no longer pure libertarians. We're now status libertarians. <laughs> we're minarchists, if we're going to make any sense of this. And now it, it, it seems imponderable to me. It seems confused to me, or at least I'm confused about it. I'm not clear as to, uh, you know, how much weight I should give to this Um if we're anarchists, we give no weight to it at all. If we're minarchists, we have to look at it from the Jewish eyes and, and say, well, you know, here's a Jew in 1925 and he wants to buy some land and he wants to be lawful. And he was lawful. He bought the land under Turkish uh, or Ottoman or whoever rules. And uh, from the libertarian, strict libertarian point of view, which we said we would only follow partially, uh, this is not kosher, so to speak. So again, we have, in my view, another imponderable. Or at least, uh, see, my criticism of Murray uh, Rothbard is that for him it's 100% clear. And for me, there's room for some sort of gray area, some sort of uh, nebulousness. So I disagree with Murray's clarity here. Uh, if I can put it in those terms. The third issue is the draining of the swamps. Uh, I, I, you're not supposed to call them swamps anymore. They have to call, what do they call them now? Wet, um, wet lands. Wet lands. Wet lands. Oh, swamps politically incorrect or something? Well, I'm sorry? Is swamps politically incorrect? Yes. No, you 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 got to get with it, boy. I mean, swamps, there are no more swamps. They're, they're just wetlands now. They've been promoted or demoted. Right. On I was told the other day that there are no waiters. Now they're called servers or something. That's right, servers. Oh. There are no waiters, and there are no actresses either. Everyone's right. And no janitors. It's the custodial arts. That's it. That's it. And, and no firemen. There are firefighters. So we have to be politically correct. The <laughs> wetlands or... Well, draining the swamps, actually, we're not that politically correct. Uh, and I'm not sure about that either. Uh, some people say, well, the, it's all well and good to drain the swamps, but the Palestinians were working in the swamps, and they've been working there before the Jews drained them. And I don't know about that. I'm, I don't know the history well enough uh, to know how much veracity I should give to that. You know, on the one hand, you know, swamps are a pain in the ass. they got crocodiles in them, and they could bite you, and... They're not worth much, and on the other hand, uh, you know, if people were homesteading those swamps, and I'm now doing a book on privatizing oceans and rivers and lakes and swamps or wetlands, so, you know, maybe they should have owned it. And I don't know the facts. Uh, so, you know, maybe Murray knows the facts of this better than I do. I'm not sure. But you asked me, you know, what, what is my view on Israel? And my view on Israel, you know, I'm Jewish, by the way. 
and I have a little, um, you know, whatever, um, I don't know, fellow feeling for, for they're my cousins out there, and, and they're being bombed, and, um, you know, uh, part of me is very much uh, pro-Israel, and part of me is uh, <coughs> not pro-Israel because of this land issue. So um, I, I don't like my answer. Usually when you ask me a question about, I don't know, um, uh, racism or, or um, uh, fractional reserve banking or, you know, uh, minimum wage or something, I'm, I'm as definite as Murray is on this issue. And I don't like the fact that I'm not definite on this issue. Uh, it, I may be, I need to do more research, but then again, you know, I'm not a historian and, and I'm more interested in theoretical stuff than, you know, which Jew or which Palestine did what to whom in, in 1932. Uh, I'm, I'm just not good enough historian to know all the facts. And if you don't know all the facts, I think you have to um, uh, not be so definite. And, you know, now Murray, Murray was amazing. I mean, he was a, a superlative economist. I think the second best economist ever, second of Mises. I think he was the best libertarian theoretician ever. And um, he was also, if, if his contribution to history w was the only thing he ever did, he would be a magnificent historian. Not to say anything about sociology or political science or legal theory or anything else. I mean, Murray was just a, a polymath, a, a genius. And I'm not. I'm doing my best to follow in his footsteps. But uh, again, I'm ashamed of myself. I should know more about the situation of what occurred in 1917 and what occurred in 1948. But... You know, we have specialization and division of labor in in everything, uh, including intellectual things, and I'm just not as knowledgeable about this. I will say in my own defense that I've not written about it. Uh, you know, <coughs> Murray has this thing that it's uh, all right to not know economics, but to have a, a strong and vociferous view about something you know nothing about is not cool. Right. Well, I... I, I I don't have strong and vociferous opinions about this because I don't know enough of the facts. I, I know the theory, I think. I, I'm clear on libertarian homesteading theory and property rights and stuff like that. I just don't know how to apply it meticulously enough to, uh, to the 1948 leaving of their homes and wanting to get back to the, um, uh, to the land purchases and to the draining of the swamps. Uh, if I knew more of the facts, maybe I'd be even more confused. Maybe I'd be less confused. I'm not sure. So that's my 10-minute answer. Sure. Well, yeah, I, I also uh, sort of am in the same boat. Um, I mean, I will say, at least in my view, uh, maybe partly because, you know, like you, I'm, I'm a Jew, but I don't really have a lot of sympathy, you know, uh, irrespective of whose land it might be. Um, you j besides for the school thing, which was horrible, and I'm I'm very upset that that happened. School thing? Well, you know the the, the Israelis bombed that school. Oh that, well, you know I have strong, I have strong views on that, and here I have published. Okay. And uh, th that issue is the issue of uh, shields. Uh, what the Palestinians do is they put their. Uh, howitzers or where, wherever they launch their missiles from, they put it right in the middle of the school or in a hospital or in a UN uh, gathering. And now uh, what they're saying in effect is you, you shouldn't shoot us back, but we should just shoot at you. Now look, suppose Israel was a legitimate country and every uh, square inch of land was legitimately owned by Jews. Look, suppose Canada was shooting missiles over to uh, New York or to Washington State or Montana. There wouldn't be any Canada in, in about five minutes uh, because the U.S. is much more powerful than Canada. Or if Mexico was shooting uh, missiles into Houston or San Antonio or something, that, that would be the end of, uh, of Mexico. If uh, Israel is perfectly legitimate and, and has 100% of the right, the opposite of what Murray is saying, then you know every time they shoot a missile in, they should shoot 10 missiles back and you know just sort of level the place. I don't believe, you know, obviously they shouldn't be killing women and children, but if the uh, bad guys use their uh, Palestinian women and children as a shield, I don't think that uh, the victim, namely the Jews in this case, should respect that. I think that they should just um, shoot the, um, uh, shoot them, shoot them back.
I mean, the Palestinians are shooting women and children. Uh, they're not doing too well because uh, the technology is very different. But I, I think that um, the, the shield argument is, is wrong. Namely, if I grab you, and I'm much more strong, stronger than you, and, and I get behind you, and I grab you under the arms, and, and I stick a gun right under your arm, and now I'm shooting, um, I don't know, uh, uh, Joe, whoever Joe is. And now the question is, and, and by the way, you have a gun, but you can't turn around and shoot me. I'm the bad guy. Uh, and Joe has a gun. And now, should you, uh, uh, and Joe can't run away. Uh, there's a closed door. And, you know, I'm shooting at Joe, and Joe's got a gun, and you've got a gun, and I've got a gun. We've all three got a gun, and I'm shooting at Joe. And now, should Joe shoot at me, and the only way he can get me is right through you? Mm -hmm. uh, should, you should Joe just say, well, you know, um, uh, you know, Mike is an innocent person, an innocent shield, and I can't shoot Mike, and that's it. And that's Murray's view. Uh, that that Joe can't shoot you, and and my view is the exact opposite. Uh, I use a reverse or negative homesteading here. You're the first. Ayn Rand. I'm sorry. So it seems like you you share Ayn Rand's view. Yes, I'm a Randian on this one. Uh, I think that um, uh, well, her her uh, analysis is different, but we come to the same conclusion, namely. Suppose there's a lightning strike. Now, I have a wristwatch here, and there's a lightning strike that's going to kill me, but I can uh, use my magic wristwatch to divert the lightning to you. One of us has got to die. And my claim is that I am the one that has to die because I'm the first homesteader of the misery, and I can't push off or pawn off the misery onto you. Mm -hmm. So if lightning is going to hit me, and the only way that I can save myself is killing you, then it would be... Um, a violation of, of libertarian theory to use the lightning to kill you. I have to accept the death uh, to be compatible with libertarian theory. Well, you're the first homesteader of the misery because I grabbed you first before I was shooting at Joe. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you may not shoot back at him even though he's shooting at us. Now, he doesn't want to hurt you. You're an innocent bystander. He realizes that you're not shooting your gun at him. Uh, but the only way he can stop me from shooting you is put a bullet right through you that goes through me. Let's say bullets, you know, go through people. And I think he would be justified in shooting. Well, this is what I'm doing is roughly what the Palestinians are doing. I'm putting my my uh, uh, rocket launchers right in the middle of a school or right in the middle of a I don't know what a, a hospital or something. And then I'm getting miffed when when the Israelis shoot back. No, uh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and uh, Obama is in a very uh, ticklish position to worry about women and children. I mean, he represents a government that... Uh, uh, bombs weddings. Uh, bombs weddings, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, uh, Dresden. Uh, that wasn't him. That was, I mean, to be fair, that wasn't him. He no. can't be responsible for what other people have done. True, but uh, he represents the government. So uh, as a, a government president... As the U.S. president, as, as a private Obama, he's fine. He can say whatever he wants. But as the representative of the U.S. government, given my statism now, I'm becoming a statist. Oh, by the way, I, I have given up uh, anarcho-capitalism. I now believe in a government apart from this. And the <laughs> government should have one function, and that is to force everyone to read Man, Economy, and State and Human Action. And we should have taxes just for that purpose. I'm kidding, of course, but uh, that would be my, <laughs> my deviation from anarchism. Uh, but as the president of the United States, you know, saying that the U.S. view is that you shouldn't kill women and children, this comes with particular ill grace from a government that slaughtered, uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Dresden, and other places like that. So uh, he, he, as a private citizen, I think, you know, you're right. He can say that because he didn't order that. Although he's been ordering drone uh, yes. attacks on. Agreed. Weddings, uh, uh, you know, uh, where he kills, you know, one uh, uh, terrorist. Terrorist is somebody you don't like, uh, and um, he kills, you know, twenty-five other people at the wedding or at the funeral or whatever. So uh, right, right. Uh, that is his fault. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sure. No. sure. If you're a bad guy and you run into a movie theater, I can't blow up the movie theater. Right. Well, you see, you see the problem with you see the problem with that is. What you have is 
is a movie theater. Uh, it's got a lot of people. And now you're subtly uh, depending upon numbers. And let's say there are 300 people in the movie theater and, and, and there's a terrorist there. And you can't bomb the thing because, you know, uh, to kill one person you lose 300 innocent people. But, you know, uh, suppose this guy's shooting from the movie theater. He's not just sitting there watching the movie like a nice terrorist. He's actually launching bombs out at people. Now can you bomb the whole place? Well, why is your life worth more than the people in the movie theater? Why, to save your own life, you have a right to sacrifice the people in the movie theater? Not my own life. Let's say he's shooting at another movie theater, and, and there are 300 people in each movie theater. So we can now get rid of the numbers, right? So here's movie theater A with a terrorist, and movie theater B with you and I in it, and uh, movie theater A terrorist is shooting a, a bomb that if the bomb gets off it'll obliterate our movie theater and, and 300 people will die. Now I'm not saying that our 300 lives are more important than the other 300 lives. What I am saying is that those 300 people were the first um, uh, inheritors or first homesteaders of the misery. Namely they've got the, the terrorists there. We don't. We're all innocent. Uh, they're not all innocent. There are 300 innocent people plus one terrorist who's actively shooting at us. And uh, I think we have a right to shoot back at him even though it'll take out 300 innocent lives because otherwise a different 300 innocent lives would be lost. And uh, you, know, you see, if you, if you look at it 300 versus one, then you get into all sorts of utilitarian issues that I want to avoid. So before, when I was giving you the case where I was grabbing you and shooting at Joe, there was just one, you versus Joe, one versus one. Now you're, you're pulling this 300 people in the movie theater crap on me, and I'm pulling another 300 people on you so that we keep the numbers even, and, and we uh, abstract from the numbers, and we just look at the principles. And the principles are, one innocent person's got to die. Right. Or 300 innocent people got to die. And I would one? say in that case, I think my view, maybe it's more Randian, but I would say, look, you don't have a right, do you have, I don't believe that you, if you're walking down the street and someone's shooting at you, I don't believe you have a right to grab someone and use that person as a human shield. But I believe that in your, you know, in your case, uh, if the bad guy puts someone else as a human shield and starts shooting, um... I would argue that it's okay for me to defend myself, and if that innocent person gets murdered, that's on the guy who starts shooting, and he's charged with murdering the innocent. Yeah, that's exactly my position. But right. Murray rejects that position, and here I disagree with him. And here I, I think I, uh, I'm not confused. I might be wrong. <laughs> I can always be wrong. When you disagree with Murray, there's always a good chance you could be wrong. But until I'm uh, convinced well, of God. I'm sorry? He's not a god. I mean, he's... Oh, no. Well, no. I, I just say that you have a, a big chance of being wrong. He's, he's not a god, but he's a genius. Okay. Look, I have maybe ten other articles where I criticize Murray. Um, so I, I don't think he's a god. I think he's just a, a brilliant, creative genius who sometimes made mistakes, in my view, and, you know, Possibly I'm wrong, but until I hear from Murray's defenders as to why I'm wrong on, on these other issues about banking or whatever, yeah. or about the, the shield, uh, you know, I'm going to stick to my own views. So it, Murray Rothbard would say, for instance, if you enter, let's say, a 7-Eleven, and there's a bank robber, and he starts shooting, and you, uh, you uh, defend yourself against the bank robber, and you shoot him, but the bullet goes out of the bank robber, or maybe, let's say, hits the TV and it comes crashing down on an innocent person. He would say that the, the person who shoots the bank robber should be charged with murder and not the bank robber himself who caused that situation to lead no, to that? No, no. no, I agree with you. The bank robber is the murderer, not the yeah. innocent guy who shot another innocent person. Right. The another yeah, that, position... That seems like a crazy thing for murder to say, but... Well, you see, another position, get, getting back to you and Joe and me, and forget about the 300, uh, it's just, you know, the movie theater doesn't help us, because I can always invent another movie theater. Uh, so it's one against one. Now, another position could be, let the best man win. You could shoot Joe, he could shoot you. Uh, he could, but libertarianism, I think, is trying to figure out what justice is. And I don't think justice is 
let the best man win or might makes right or whoever is the more skillful uh, um, marksman. I think we have to do better than that. I think we have to have a theory. And I have a theory, and, and the, the, theory, the theory is negative homesteading. Whoever is the first homesteader of the misery has to accept the misery and can't pawn it off on anyone else. And I resort to my lightning example with my magic wristwatch. If the lightning is about to hit me and the only way I can save myself is to kill you, now the Randians might not agree with that because the Randians think that you know each person is... Uh, uh, precious and each person should defend himself but then the Randians I think would have no answer to the question of well if, if I should defend myself and kill you based well, on well Ayn Rand did say that there's no such thing as uh, there's no such thing as um, a, what's that word I'm looking for ah um, oh, crap like, uh, I don't know, uh, what's that word when, when innocent people die in war I'm blank, why am I breaking out on the term a collateral damage. Ayn Rand said there's no such thing as collateral damage in war. Well, there, there is. And then, no, but she said that's not murder, which is crazy. Ah. Which is crazy, but... Well, well, but it is murder, but it's not the murder of, of the... Uh, uh, but, it's, but the blame is, is not the person who murders, it's the blame of the person who hides in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the school. So when Israel currently said, when Israel currently uh, killed people in that school, they said uh, it's Hamas's fault. You you would agree with that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, Hamas visited the misery first on those people by making them shields. So now, assuming Israel is in the right, uh, and you know our previous discussion was, I was very unclear about that, uh, very confused. If if you want. Uh, assuming Israel is in the right, if Hamas puts a, uh, a, a missile launcher in the middle of a school or a hospital and Israel bombs the missile launcher and kills collateral damage, uh, namely kills innocent people, it is the fault of Hamas, not uh, of Israel. In well, you know, um, I, I, you know, uh, Golda Meir said that I can forgive the Arabs for uh, murdering us. But I can't forgive them for ma for making us murderers. Well, I I agree mostly with what she said, but but the Arabs didn't make the Jews murderers; they were the murderers. Uh, murder is wrong for killing. The Jews were the killers. Right. But killing is sort of morally neutral. Mm -hmm. Right. Murder is uh, always negative. So uh, the Jews killed. The collateral damage, the the, sh the 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 people, the shield, the innocent women and children. Right. Uh, but the Arabs were the murderers. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, because I mean, I mean, based, you know, based on on what little I know about this, you know, Hamas does not care about anyone else. They don't care about Palestinians. They're just a terrorist gang, and what they want is. They want purposefully to have the most innocent people die, so they can use that as propaganda and say, "Look how bad um, uh, the the, uh, the Israeli government is when they, you know, when they're sort of just doing what you describe, uh, which, you know, when people are shooting back at them and they're purposely putting people in harm's way as a propaganda." And it seems like a lot of people are swallowing that. Well. Uh... You know, this is all predicated on Israel being in the right. And to me, as a libertarian, the way to determine that is is if they are uh, based on the property rights, which I'm not sure about. Let me talk about a different issue uh, that, that might be relevant. You know, we had not a civil war in, in 1861 in, uh, in the U.S. It was a war of northern aggression. Right. A civil war is when two armed camps each want to run the whole thing. Uh, namely the entity composed of both of them. So, for example, the Spanish Civil War of 36 was a civil war because the fascists and the commies each wanted to run the whole of Spain. Similarly, uh, the uh, Civil War of Russia in 1917 was a civil war because each side, the red and the white, wanted to run the whole of Russia. But the um, uh, War of 1861 was a war of northern aggression or a war to prevent southern secession because the southerners didn't want to run the north was only the North wanted to run both. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, millions of people were killed, uh, or at least hundreds of thousands of people, uh, many innocents and many soldiers. And by the way, they all wore uniforms in those days, uh, compatible with the Geneva Convention, which the Hamas and the Arabs don't. You know, it's hard to tell who's a civilian and who's not a civilian if they don't wear an army uniform, which is a whole other issue. Now, comes the issue, comes the question, could all of this carnage have been saved? Because slavery was ended in every other country in North and South America without any war. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a lot of people suggested was, well, let's just buy out the slave owners. The slave owners paid, you know, money for slaves, and, and the slave owners don't want to give that up. So, look, it's a lot cheaper to buy them off, even though it's totally unjust, because <clears throat> slavery is a, a vicious, um, depraved, uh, immoral, uh, despicable system, and I oppose it, despite what the New York Times thinks. You know, they think somehow I, I favor slavery. I don't favor slavery. I think slavery is an abomination, and certainly... Perhaps the second most serious violation of libertarian uh, principles, the first one would be murder or mass murder, and the second right. one would be slavery. I'm sorry? Genocide would be number one. Well, genocide, mass murder would be the, the worst thing, and, uh, and slavery would be the second worst. I mean, heck, I'd rather be a slave than killed, so I think, think being murdered is worse than being enslaved. Okay, so what they could have done, and, and there is research on this, they could have, with a fraction of the cost, and, and even forgetting about lives, just the uh, cost in terms of economics, you know, when they're fighting, they're not producing anything. Just in terms of money, they could have paid with a very small fraction of what the, that war of 1861 cost. They could have bought out all the slave owners, and, and there wouldn't have been any slavery anymore. Right. Now, how do we apply that to the Jewish-Palestinian um, issue? Well, instead of fighting with bullets or with ballots, let's fight with dollars. Let's see who can buy out who. Uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, Arab countries get together, and they've got a lot of money, uh, you know, oil sheiks and whatever. Let them make offers to, to the Jews to buy them out. And the Jews have got some money too, and let them buy uh, Arab money. Now, the problem is that right now, any Arab who sells land to a Jew gets executed by, by the Hamas or by the um, uh, other group. Um, what's the other group that Hamas kicked out of Gaza? Uh, I forget the name. The, 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 the guy in charge of the, the Palestinians. I can't think of it just like you couldn't think of collateral damage. We're both getting Alzheimer's, although I've got more reason. <laughs> I'm a older than you. <laughs> uh, let's have a bidding war, and let's get rid of all these laws that say if you sell to the other... I, now, I don't think that if a Jew sells to an Arab, there's a death penalty, but uh, I don't think the Jews would be too happy to have Jews sell to Arabs either. But uh, I know that the Arabs, uh, if a, an Arab sells to a Jew land, they'll execute him. Uh, which is, you know, a problem. Uh, so I would say, you know, I think the Jews would win uh, this um, financial battle because I'm not sure who has more money, the Arab sheiks with oil or the Jews with, you know, other things, but I think the Jews are more rabid about this. You know, Eretz Israel, you know, uh, we have to have a homeland so that uh, if uh, Hitler comes again, we, we won't be, uh, uh, you know, killed en masse. So I think the Jews would win, uh, which is irrelevant, but still I think this would be a, a way analogous to uh, getting rid of the, the, the death and destruction of the War of 1861 by buying out the slaves. Not that I favor that because it's unjust because those guys should have you know, gone to jail or been uh, penalized for holding slaves, and now you're paying them off. But still, you know, from a utilitarian point of view, and you know, utilitarianism has got some interesting contributions to make to this dialogue, from a utilitarian point of view, uh, we would have been a better off place had that uh, War of Northern Aggression of 1861 never been perpetrated and instead the slaves bought out and, and we would have been like every other country up and down uh, the North and South America, which got rid of slavery without any devastating war. Well, maybe the, the way to get rid of the Fourth Intifada, the, the Fourth War, is to you know borrow a leaf from that and let, let the 
uh, let, let's have a, a bidding war. Let the Arabs try to bid the Jews out of their land, which I don't think is going to happen much, and let the Jews try to bid the Arabs out of their land, and I think that would happen a lot more. And that would be a way of solving the problem. Now, it might cost the Jews a lot of money to buy out all the Arabs, or at least all the Palestinians, uh, and then you know they could go and live in in those areas where uh, Jew Jewish land was stolen in um, in um, uh, 1948 in in Egypt and Syria and everywhere else, and that would be sort of a way of solving the whole problem without you know getting into the nitty gritty of who's right, uh, namely are the Jews right in in kicking the um, 1948 Arabs out who took a vacation or you know uh, left the country. And those are the problems. So I would seriously um, advocate that. Now, um, I think it was Stefan Kinsella who uh, said, "Look, let's give the Jews Wyoming, or, or you know, half of Wyoming, or something like that." Uh, uh, let's. Uh, no, you see that. And then there's a whole other issue, and that's the um, the uh, war reparations from Germany uh, for the Holocaust. Germany has paid an awful lot of money. To Jews because of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and the money went to um, Israel. Now another argument is they shouldn't have paid money. They should have given I don't know one eighth of Germany to the Jews, and have Israel right in the middle of Germany, maybe right near Munich or I don't know um, near one of those concentration camps. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think I don't think the Jews would have took it. I think they said I. Germany was so traumatic, I want to be as far away from here as possible. Yeah, well, I, look, I don't think they're going to take Wyoming either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just mentioning, you know, uh, uh, arguments that have been made. And an argument that has been made is, look, the Germans were the bad guys. They had concentration camps. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the reparations should have been, you know, one-eighth of Germany or one-sixth of Germany or whatever the, the number is, is unimportant, and, and put Israel right there, make it a Jewish state right there. Now, I think you're right. They they, they wouldn't want that. They would want to get as far away from there as possible, and, and also the religious Jews want to be in Jerusalem for religious reasons, and Wyoming uh, just doesn't cut it in, you know, from that perspective. But I'm just mentioning ways where the senseless deaths uh, could be uh, eliminated. Uh, we can't do anything about past deaths, but the way we're going in two, three, five years, we're going to do this again, and another uh, 10,000 um, uh, Palestinians are going to die needlessly, and another um, 500 Israelis are going to die needlessly, or whatever the numbers are. I don't know the numbers, but uh, it's usually 20 to 1 or 30 to 1, something like that, and it's a uh, a shame and a disgrace because every human life is precious. Uh, these uh, terrorists could, they're very clever, they could be putting their um, brains to use in um, desalinating the water or, you know... Well, I mean, they did the tunnels. They did the tunnels, yeah, right? They, they did tunnels. They could build tunnels where people travel on instead of uh, for the those purposes of those tunnels. Uh, and, you know, the, the Jews uh, are great creative people. Uh, I say this bragging about ourselves. You know, the, Israel is, uh, is very productive. They've got a computer industry there. They've got all sorts of industries. Look, uh, the real problem is, um, you know, going to Mars and colonizing Mars and, and the moon. And, uh, you know, one of these days the Earth, uh, our sun is going to go out. And we want to have spaceships to be able to go to some other uh, solar system. And all this killing of each other isn't helping us go to another solar system. We want to get rid of cancer and, and HIV and, and uh, Ebola, which is another thing in the news now. And instead, we keep killing each other. I mean, we want to live forever. We want to go to Mars and the moon and, and other planets and other solar systems. Uh, you know, suppose some uh, creatures from some other solar system come by here, like in uh, those movies, um, Star Trek, and they see us Earthlings just killing each other, and they say, you guys are morons, you're no better than the apes or something, and uh, they, they'd be sort of right. I mean, can't we, can't we live together without killing each other? Uh, so maybe this uh, way of settling the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue... Uh, through money and not bullets might be a contribution in that direction, similarly to what could have been done but wasn't done uh, with regard to um, 
uh, the War of 1861 in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of people ask me about this topic, and I, I sort of wanted to become, I sort of wanted to shut up about this topic because it seems a lot of uh, libertarians are on the Palestinian side, and I'm not, mainly because, uh, the, generally speaking, uh, you know, the Palestinians more than the other side. Uh, straps on bombs, they go to pizza restaurants, they blow stuff up. So it's hard for me to be on a side uh, 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 where people purposefully uh, blow innocent people. Whereas the other side, yes, they kill innocent people and this is horrible, but this is not, th this is not you know, on purpose. This is not just strapping a bomb and, and blowing yourself up to see who can kill the most amount of people. Well, you know, I, on the other hand, you know, what you're really dealing with is a first world power, Israel, with a third world power. Uh, I, I don't know, in Vietnam, the U.S. was a first world power and, and uh, Vietnam was a third world power, and, and guess who won that war? And it right. wasn't the U.S. And uh, the same thing with Russia and Afghanistan. When Russia was in Afghanistan, Russia was a first world power, Afghanistan was a third world power, and... Uh, uh, the Russians uh, had to leave with their tails between their legs too, uh, between uh, as in uh, as in the, the case of uh, Vietnam. So you can't always tell, but Israel certainly is a higher tech, uh, you know, with the Iron Dome missile uh, missile protection, anti-ballistic missile uh, systems. Uh, it, it's just a, a an unholy mess. Uh, I I I'm sort of. You know, I'm a Jew, so I have this visceral um, uh, love for Israel. On the other hand, I'm a libertarian, and I have this visceral hate for needless deaths. Mm -hmm. and, and we're just serving up needless deaths. And um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, getting off the Israeli-Arab um, thing for a minute, there are Palestinian, not Palestinian, Arab deaths between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And it seems to me that Sykes Picot is responsible for a lot of that. If they would just make, you know, a Kurdistan and a, and a Sunni stan and a, a Shiite stan, uh, three countries, um, you know, then they wouldn't be fighting with each other. I mean, this guy Maliki is, you know, uh, on on the one camp, and and he's uh, uh, hurting all the other people. The same thing with Syria. What they ought to do is have secession, again, not down to the individual level, as the anarchists would say, but secession uh, to, to the level of uh, ethnic groups. Uh, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds each should have their own country. Uh, Tur Turkey isn't going to like that because there are Kurds in Turkey that uh, Kur Turkey doesn't want to let go of. But I think that uh, a long-run prognostication for less killing would be to take, uh, you know, the eastern third of Turkey, I, I guess, uh, would be the Kurds, and, and link them up with the Kurds in Iraq. I mean, the only good thing about these wars is that we get to know geography better. Yes. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's a Mark Twain line, right? Uh, what did Mark Twain say? God created a war so that Americans would learn geography. Ah, I didn't realize he said it. I thought I was... He stole it from me, by the way. <laughs> I thought that was my idea. It's attributed to him. I don't know if he actually said it, but... Well, he it, stole it from me. Said it. Murray stole a lot of ideas from me, too. It's true that he published it in 2013. He stole a lot of my ideas also. Before I thought of it, but that, that's a minor detail. Yeah, I mean, the, the great benefit of all these wars is we learn more than we really should know, given specialization and division of labor. Who wants to know where, um, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail is or, or whatever uh, the, these exotic places? Are better off not knowing and people there not being killed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really just a disgrace when you, you see human beings, are, and, and they're so against secession, like the Randians are rabid, you know, we can't have secession. Are they really? Oh, yeah, well, you know, your buddy, uh, your buddy, Jan Helfeld, doesn't want to have, well, no, actually, he's good on secession in... Um, right, he just sent us a video about that. Yes, yeah, so where was it he wanted to see the... Um, a U uh, Russia. Russia and Ukraine. Okay. So he's good on that, it's just that he doesn't follow it logically to its logical conclusion. But um, why do you call him the Randians? They hate that term. But he is a Randian, isn't he? They don't but, like that term. That's like know. calling a Jew a kike or something. Really? Know? I didn't know that. They, it's objectivist. It's like hate oh, speech. Oh, 
Oh, I did. You know, because Randian sounds cultish. You know, it's like calling anarchists. Maybe but they, but they are, they are a cult. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I know, but they don't want to think of themselves. Well, I don't care. It, it, uh, <laughs> uh, it's sort of like using the N word for black people, not uh, not N I G G E R, but N I G G A R D L Y. That word. Cheap. Yes, cheap. It yeah, means, but uh, but black people uh, uh, object to that. Right. I don't know. We we got to be so careful nowadays in these politically correct times not to insult anyone. But I mean, the Randians are a cult. God damn it! I mean, yeah. Murray wrote this brilliant thing: the sociology of the Ayn Rand cult. Right. Look, Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon converted me to libertarianism. I know those people very well, and they were a cult. Boy, were they a cult! Right. And they still are cultish. I think he wrote that article because. Didn't she want him to lead his wife because she was uh, religious, right? Well, no. Rand was uh, moderate. He, she didn't command Murray to leave his wife immediately. He uh, said he'd give him a year to convert her to atheism, and then if she didn't convert to atheism, then Murray <laughs> should leave his wife. <laughs> See what a moderate she is? That's, that's so whereas, ridiculous. Whereas an extreme cultist would say, leave her immediately. Uh, Rand was uh, moderate. That's, well, look, I don't care if my wife is a uh, libertarian. Well, my wife isn't libertarian. <laughs> Neither is my daughter, but I you know, still love them. So go figure. So anyway, what were you saying? I interrupted you. With what I was you saying something brilliant, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> okay. Well, it's been about an hour, and and uh, we these things usually go for an hour. So sure, maybe we should wrap up. But we're gonna go once a month, and uh, it's always yeah, a joy. And it was great to meet you at the Mises University. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Just a wonderful experience. Uh, anyone who hasn't been to the Mises University is missing out. And not only Mises University, but the Mises Institute, which has many, many more um, offerings than just the Mises University. Um, uh, books on the web and, and uh, I don't know, uh, cir Mises circles in all sorts of cities. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the Mises Institute. And let me end with a, uh, an advertisement for my own school, Loyola University. I'm having a little trouble with some of the people here now, but we do have about 10 people, the entire economics department, and maybe five other professors who are very, very free enterprise, and therefore we've got a whole bunch of students who are uh, free enterprise libertarians. So if students come here, transfer or from high school, you'll be uh, a beautiful swan, you won't be an ugly duckling, that you will be at most other schools. Cool. Well, is the problem with the New York Times, is that, you said there's a problem with that, is that still? Well, the New York Times said I favored slavery and I'm a bum. And, and they're then the still on that, huh? I'm sorry? They're still on that. Oh, I'm suing them. Yeah, I'm going to sue them. Uh, uh, yeah. And then the president of my university said, you know, Block is a disgrace because he favors slavery. Uh, and I haven't got an apology out of him yet, but, you know, I'm working on that. And uh, as soon as I do, then that issue will fall apart or end. And if I don't, I'll sue him and the university as well. But uh, still, come here, students, because uh, we got a lot of professors here. We got maybe 10 out of about 250, which is a very, very high proportion. I mean, at next door to Lane and at LSU uh, over in Baton Rouge, they don't have one professor uh, uh, who's a libertarian. They had Eric Mack uh, at Tulane, but he's retiring. So come on down to New Orleans. The water is fine, or rather, there's no water anymore since Katrina. The place is recovered. Cool. Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to help you, but maybe you should tell the the person who accuses you of being pro-slavery. You should say to him, "Well, if you're, well, the New York Times and maybe even you are pro-slavery because you're against secession." Ah, I, I don't think that'll work, but it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care and thanks for anyway, having me. Anyway, great having you on. Take care. Bye. Bye.